And while we're getting organized here, I wanted to point out that I chose this painting to show um, for the beginning of our EPS business me EPSP business meeting. It's by Tony Foster, if any of you know the name, um, a very famous painter of landscapes. And he goes on journeys. He's been to Antarctica, um, all over the world, um, many remote canyons. He goes rafting. And he paints his landscapes in the field uh, on immense canvases. And then he assembles these into very large um, exhibits. And they're combined with his notes, his journal notes, like field notes. So it's something that kind of resonates with those of us who do field work. It's, I highly recommend checking out his work. And there is a gallery nearby, the Foster in Palo Alto, um, for that work. So it's a nice welcome here for all of you. So I'd like to introduce first the officers who are up here. And they are myself, president of EPSP, Gordon Grant, president-elect, and Noah Snyder, who's sitting here, our secretary. Thank you. And we also have Kimberly Hill, who leads our efforts for fall meeting programming. And she'll be speaking a little bit later about fall meeting programming, something crucial to what we do, one of the most important things. Um, throughout this, this at one hour, we're going to have our business meeting, so-called business meeting, with an award celebration at the end. And we'll be congratulating the awardees, Kellen Whipple of the G.K. Gilbert Award, and Joel Scheingross, the Luna B. Leopold Award. And then Joel will give the Sharp Lecture. Um, that's customary that we give the Sharp Lecture to the person who receives the Luna B. Leopold Early Career Award. Um, after that, there is a new event that Eric Barefoot and Allison Pfeiffer have um, uh, together put together for us for EPSP. And it's a, a social mixer. Some of you probably have tickets to it. It's sold out quickly. We apologize, we hope, to get enough funding to have a bigger event next year. If you go to the event and you see that you get a little plate of cheese, that's $100 at San Francisco AGU. <laughs> and the beer, another 40. So, but that's what you'll get, beer and cheese or something. It's pretty good actually, but it is costly. So we hope to open this up to uh, more people in the future, um, have larger early career events. And there have been requests to have mid-career events. Mid-career folks, raise your hands if you'd like a mid-career event. Yeah, I hear from them that you're always welcome to tell me these things, that you'd like to have things to help you with career um, wisdom pieces. I do want to thank Tess Thompson. She's on the executive committee for EPSP, and she gave us the idea for this networking event where junior members of the committee will be sitting in a room and going from table to table and kind of speed networking. And they, Eric and um, Allison and others, selected the people to come to that from a, a diverse range of career pathways. Our membership, um, I have not updated the numbers as of today. I was at a meeting with Gordon today and we, they are not able, we are not able to get the database to work on our computers for right now for some reason. So these are the numbers as of last year, but I can tell you that we have more members because I saw the numbers this morning. And if you combine our primary members and total members, um, this year we have well over 11,000. And we have many students, so all is good. We are a growing section. We've been growing for quite some time, and that's wonderful. Um, we are the 10th largest by, in terms of our primary members. AGU has all sorts of clever ways to give us money, um, three of them, actually. And one of those is that if someone who's a primary member gives $50 at least, um, and we get 5% of our members doing that, so that would be about 57 people, we can then get a match of $1,000. And it goes up, so the more primary members we get to give at least $50, the more match we can get. And when we get funds like that, we take them right away towards things like the early career um, social mixer event. So that's our one of our, and student travel, although there's, there's now new money, as you'll see, for student travel. There are other funds coming in for that. But those are our most important tasks, I think, um, not only to celebrate science and achievement, but to support the early career folks so they can come to the meetings, so they can have events to get together and network. In addition to myself, um, there are other members on the executive committee. There are about 25 of us. Um, it's quite fun and we hope that if any of you are ever interested in serving on the committee, you come to see any one of us that you see here or know our secretary. Um, we welcome people who are eager to come to the practice and play the game and stay on the team for a while and help us to shape the future of our section. 
and to continue to celebrate our achievements and have good signs at our meetings. Um, someone who could, I think Andrew might be here, Andrew Wilcox, um, I didn't see him earlier today, but I know he's here somewhere. Um, he's, and he's chair of the awards committee, so he does a fantastic job helping to guide us through the process of uh, going through the nominations. At this time, we have a very important request for all of you. Uh, we want very much for anyone who could be deserving of the Gilbert Award or the Leopold Award to be nominated. And if someone out there is deserving and highly accomplished and isn't nominated, then they can't get it. It's not a lot of effort to nominate someone, and you can ask us to give you advice on that. We can tell you people who have done it and who have been successful as nominators. There are some skills related to it that are relatively easy, I think, to pass on. And you could help us to get really good nominees and to get um, our accomplished colleagues and peers um, recognized for that. We have a fellows committee to identify those one in a thousand AGU members. One, only one in a thousand becomes a fellow. I think Gordon is a fellow. Congratulations. Um, so we have to nominate them. Again, it's, it's a matter of us, those of us in the community, looking around and saying, who out there is amazing and I want to nominate that person. So we need you to help us to identify them. You can send me an email anytime you want and say, I know someone that maybe you haven't gotten to know. Maybe you don't know his or her work. She's in coastal processes. You're in rivers. So you should really check this out and find someone to help nominate her. So please let us know for fellows or awards. Um, this year, as you'll see later, I'll talk about how we've had four fellows. It's very hard to get people through the fellows process. It's very rigorous. But we managed to do fairly well each year, thanks to the work of Kellen and others on the committee and um, subcommittee. And, Ke and Ellen Wool was going to be taking over as chair of that committee this coming year. So, um, and then we have a web page social media fundraising committee with Jewel Scheingross, Claire Masteller, Kieran Dunn, and Kate Leary. Though um, we'll hear more from them a little bit later about what they do. We have an early career committee with Eric Barefoot, Austin Chadwick, and Haima Hassan Rokadop Gudibati. All right. People who have helped to make the fall meeting successful, thank you. Um, this is the group, chaired, by, chaired wonderfully by Kimberly Hill. And you can see the names of all the others there. I'd like to do, give them a round of applause. <laughs> and we're going to have Kimberly speak to us now a little bit about the fall meeting. Thanks so much, Dorothy. And actually, on behalf of the whole program committee, I want to thank all of you to, for helping make this a really amazing meeting. There's been a lot of people proposing new sessions this time. Um, there, there's, a, there's a great turnover of um, sort of fresh ideas coming out. There's a great sustenance of traditional classic topics that are being represented and exciting things are going on there. And thanks to all of you for submitting abstracts and coming and, and keeping on presenting your research to us and, and sharing it with us. These are all parts of um, why I love being part of the program committee because it's really uh, helped me learn a lot about what you do and in interacting a, a, with a lot of you individuals. Um, so that being said, I want to encourage other people who are really excited to do all of that to consider, first of all, joining the program committee. And I, I think in the past when I stood up here, I've really encouraged, and I want to keep on encouraging the, um, the junior scientists, junior engineers um, to, to be in involved in submitting sessions, especially when you see a, a new upcoming topic that you're involved in and you don't see represented. Um, it would be great to have you propose a session. If you want help with that, you can talk to any of us on the program committee and we'll, we'll get you around to the right person. We'll try to, you know, we'll, we'll help you connect with senior members to help, get, if you want, to help give you more experience. Um, I also want to encourage senior folks who feel like there's, there's topics that we're not representing as well to come join the fall committee as well. It, you know, it takes all of us, and, and I would say that uh, I've really benefited from this community, and, and I know a lot of other people who have, from the, from the nature of how supportive the people who are leaders in our field are of junior people and how energetic the junior people are and and as a sort of person in the middle the middle career people as well it just a, it's a really great community um, but I would say the program committee is a unique opportunity to get involved um, 
go to interesting places, meet interesting people. There's <laughs> so, so please, please do consider um, becoming um, even more involved. And, and if you have any questions about the program committee feedback for us in terms of how the program's been put together in different years, we, we love to get that. And so, so please contact us. Um, and that's, that's all I wanted to say. Oh, and, and really a special, special thanks to Marissa Palucius, who's been there working with, with me for, for a few years now and is the chair to be, um, and a couple others who put a lot of time in this year, Sarah Baumgartner and Claire Masteler mckenzie Andrew, Kyle, Ben, and Noah. You've, uh, so so I, I wanna make sure that they're acknowledged too for all the hard work. So thanks, thanks again. Thanks, Dorothy, for the time. All right, I'd like to thank Roman DiBiase, Jonathan Shuba, Eitan Shalef, Carl Lang, Noah Snyder, and Alex Beer for helping to find hundreds of people, I think, to judge the uh, student presentations, oral and poster. How many is it, Roman? 501 slots, so amazing effort. And they are judging them so that we can decide who's going to get the Outstanding Student Presentation Award, which does include a gift of funds, in addition to the prestige and the honor. So thank you again to that group. Um, at the meeting this year, compared to last year, we do have, I think, about 35 oral sessions, um, 29 poster sessions, and 11 e-lightning and short talk sessions. I don't know how many we had last year. I don't know if you do, Kimberly. Any e-lightning? We, we had uh, about four e-lightning. Okay. Four. Anybody go to eat lightning talks or give e lightning talks? What do you think? Do you like them in general? I hear a yes, clapping if you like it. <laughs> oh, Jim says no. Okay. <laughs> well, I heard some good things from some people about them, but there were 946 abstracts. Mm -hmm. So in general, we've been in about that number for many years, for about five years now, I think. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like we're holding strong. Um, so we are about communicating and celebrating our science and scientific achievement. And one of the ways in this centennial year that um, we've been able to communicate um, and celebrate this achievement is through some special centennial papers. And Noah Finnegan's been involved with some of those, Noah and some others for the um, AGU journal or surface. And then there also are other AGU journals like Water Resources that have had some centennial papers. I know Ellen Wool had one. So there's some really neat things coming out because of the centennial year, the 100th year for AGU. So there's a, a whole suite of papers that are review papers and looking forward papers. It is a, an amazing effort to put all these together. And it gives us something to, um, to help us to celebrate what our, our section has achieved, the people in our section. We have a new web page um, that was unveiled this year. Joel Scheingross and some others helped very much with that. Um, I'll show that in a moment. That's another way that we can communicate, and I was told by AGU staff this morning that ours is showcased as one of the, maybe the best, I think we were told, the best of all sections, and they use it as a role model for other sections. So you'll see that in a moment. There also are these narratives that are part of the centennial event, and again, they're a way to celebrate scientific achievement, and they've been interviewing people and making um, these stories, these stories about them. I thought you did one, Gordon, is that correct? There's, there are other people besides the list I have here. So Tom Dunn, Joe Marshall, Doug Jeromack, Gordon, and maybe some others of you. But those are very um, nice ways also to get personal accounts of someone's career, of the things that they're passionate about scientifically, <laughs> of course. All right, and then here's the webpage I told you about. Um, it has, as you can see, um, a very nice banner across the top. It has career listings going down the left there, publications in the middle, all the latest tweets there on the right, and much more. It's very clean, very elegant, very streamlined, um, very easy to interact with. And we did spend some time on this. I was mostly just a bystander watching as the progress um, took place. But we are happy with it, and we hope you check it out. Um, thanks to NOAA, um, we have now, we've had two recent newsletters. When I became president-elect, uh, it was my task to try to put together some newsletters, and it, I found it very challenging because there's a lot of news, and you have to get all the news together, and you have to check it all out, and get, hear from all your colleagues, and then send it off to AGU, and have it then submitted and vetted and released. And there are so many tasks for the president-elect and president that it, it was very difficult to, to make that happen. And so Noah has wonderfully stepped up and is making that happen now. So please reach out to him if you have any news you want in our newsletter. 
We now have many ways to, to tell people what we're doing, but this is one of them. And there's a permanent record there. They're on the website. You can go there and check them out. And you can see this record of who's gotten the awards and who's gotten the Outstanding Student Presentation Awards and so forth. All right. Now I'm going to be turning this over to people who are on our social media um, subcommittee who are doing wonderful things. And they had this one thing called Twitter takeovers. And when they were telling me about this morning, all the things that they do, and I had made this slide, I thought, why don't we have them do a business meeting takeover? Right? So <laughs> they're taking over, and they're going to come up here and present on what they've been doing, rather than let me tell you what they've been doing. So take over, take away. Hi, everyone. So I'm Claire Masteller, and I am part of the social uh, media committee, along with Kieran Dunn and Kate Leary, who cannot be here today. And so, as Dorothy said, we the EPSP section does have a Twitter. And the vision of that Twitter is ultimately to serve as a community resource, but also as a community platform, platform for all of you, and to showcase all of the great science that you guys are all doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So as part of that, we do organize these Twitter takeovers, many of which are for our monthly early career spotlights run by the student committee, as well as for some of the meetings that go on throughout the year. We would love to have more of these and for give, to give you the opportunity to showcase some of the science that you're doing. And so there are a lot of ways that you can engage with the Twitter. The easiest way is to follow us on Twitter at, at e AGU underscore EPSP. Um, we post um, pretty much daily with job opportunities, internship opportunities, um, information about upcoming meetings and events, so on and so forth. A second step, if you want to get even more engaged, is to do a Twitter takeover. So if you have an event that you think would be interesting to feature, or if you have some really cool field work or experiments or modeling work that you're doing that you want to share with the community, please contact one of us so we can give you the platform to do that. The third way that you can engage with the social media is to act as one of our social com media committee members. So we are looking for new membership. Um, and that can be a, or, and then there are a couple arms in which you can p participate in terms of managing day-to-day -day Twitter operations, helping out with setting up these takeovers, or also um, as working to develop professional development resources or crowdsourcing initiatives through the Twitter that then end up as permanent fixtures on our website resources page. So if you have any questions about that or any ideas of how you want to engage with us on social media throughout the year, come find me or Kieran today through Gilbert Club and chat with us. Thanks. I just want to emphasize that you do not need to have a Twitter account to do a takeover. Yeah. And if you're nervous about uh, putting yourself out there or you've never posted on Twitter or done anything like this before, we're here to help. So we're here to walk you through the process if you need it, consult, whatever you, uh, whatever you need. We just want you to get involved and we want to showcase your work. And one more thing, this is a great way for students to introduce themselves to the rest of the community. So if you have students that are doing really cool stuff, please encourage them to get in touch with us so they can share it with all of us. Thanks. Thank you. It is very exciting what you're doing. I'm going to tell a story about how easy it is to use Twitter. Um, this is incredibly embarrassing for me, but it is a very funny story, so I, have, I can't resist telling you. I was on a conference call with people at USAID recently, and they were talking about using Twitter for this and that, and someone, I said, well, you know, I don't have a Twitter account. And he said, oh, one of them said, yes, you do. You have one. I said, no, I'm sure I don't, because I'm looking at it right now. So um, he told me how to do it. It's embarrassing, right? So I went and I looked, and sure enough, there were posts of toys and these little creatures flying in the air. It's my granddaughter. She was six, six years old. So I had apparently made a Twitter account, and she got on there and, and tweeted things. So don't check. It's there. <laughs> so all right, so um, let's go forward then. It's easy, right, if she could do it. <laughs> student activities. So some folks are coming up to tell us about all the things they're doing, early student and early career activities as well, I think. Thanks, Dorothy. Good evening, everyone. Um, so we are the student committee um, at the moment, um, but we are actively seeking to grow the student committee. So my name is Eric, this is Hima, and this is Austin. Um, you're going to see a picture of us in a second. But 
Um, we are actively seeking new members of the committee, so if you are interested in becoming involved in student activities through PSP, we highly recommend you reach out to us either individually or you can use the link on there on the screen and there's an application you can fill out. Um, we're going to start doing evaluations and get in touch with people around sometime in mid-January, so we look forward to hearing from everybody. This is another good way, as Claire was mentioning, to really introduce yourself to the community and sort of involve yourself in the activities that make the AGU possible and also this meeting a really good success. Um, we also really want people to continue to nominate individuals that they think are stellar for the early career spotlight. Um, we like highlighting these kinds of things and we like doing these profiles and we, we need um, everyone to supply us with more material. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention is that early career students will be getting together at Southern Pacific Brewing Company tomorrow evening and we'll be having a night of fellowship and discussions um, and meeting your colleagues from across the, the entire spectrum of, of the Earth system. So please come out and meet us there and uh, Hema and Austin and I will be walking from the Northeast northeast corner of Moscone West around 615, so please, uh, if you don't know how to get there, you can meet us there and we'll take you there. Thanks very much, everyone. If you are not a U.S. citizen or you don't have a U.S.-based ID, you should probably bring a passport. And then, if you want to talk to us after the meeting or at Gilbert Club, this is what we look like. <laughs>
and outstanding contributions to earth and planetary surface processes. And it's also a person has to be a person who has promoted an environment of unselfish cooperation in research and the inclusion of early career scientists in the field. Um, there are a few who have done this. Um, it's hard to do all those things and do them incredibly well, but there are a few. And each year, five or six are nominated, and the awards committee goes through those nomination packages and selects one. And this year, the award goes to Kellen Whipple of Arizona State University. And I'd like to say that I got to know Kellen when I was um, a, brand, a, a brand new PhD um, professor, and I met him in the field when he was a grad student at University of Washington. We became good friends, so I feel very fortunate, as some others of you do, to be not only an admirer of his work, but a friend as well. And it is with great sadness that I must tell you um, that his brother passed away several days ago. And many years ago, his brother had joined um, Noah and myself. Noah was his first PhD student in the field. So I got to meet that amazing brother, Galen. And of course, Kellen is devastated and cannot be here. So we've all talked among us about what to do, and we want to, of course, um, celebrate his career and his achievements and to send him our best wishes and to help him um, bring, bring him some happiness during this difficult time. So what we've decided to do is to have Arjun Heimsath, who, gave, who nominated him, to go ahead and read the citation and then have Noah, who was his first PhD student, read the response that Kellen had written. And then Kieran Dunn's going to come up and take pictures of us with the certificate, and we're going to text them to Kellen. Um, he knows that we are having um, Arjun and Noah here read uh, the citation and response. So he's with us in spirit, I'm sure. And hopefully, by doing this, we can bring him a little bit of happiness today. So with that, I'll bring up Arjun to give the citation. I promised Dorothy I wouldn't cry. I'll try not to. Um, hi. Professor Kellen Whipple is a remarkable scientist, mentor, and community builder who is an ideal recipient of the 2019 G.K. Gilbert Award in Surface Processes for his seminal studies on the role of fluvial incision as the key process linking climate tectonics and landscape evolution. With over 120 publications and 21 mentored graduate students, Kellen contributes significantly to our field across many topical areas, including fluvial and glacial processes, tectonic geomorphology, and debris flow mechanics linked with alluvial fan development. This unending scientific brilliance is combined with this selfless promotion of collaborative research and achievement by young scientists. Through his incisive integration of field observations with both natural and laboratory experiments, and with prescient and creative analytical and numerical exploration, he leads efforts to quantify critical controls on mountain landscape evolution and its external drivers, climate variability, and active tectonics. Over the past 20 plus years, Kellen and his students have published about 60 papers quantifying how river incision is the key process connecting the external drivers of climate and tectonics with landscape evolution, thus setting the pace for how landscapes evolve. Central to all of his work is his ability to couple detailed field, lab, and modeling efforts into an integrated whole that solves or makes significant progress towards solving important problems related to how planetary surfaces evolve. Kellen is an exceptionally keen field geologist as well as a meticulous experimentalist. Importantly, in addition to his scientific achievement and the continued vibrancy of his career, Kellen maintains remarkably good humor, tireless attention to detail, seemingly boundless patience, and enviable intellectual curiosity. 
He is constantly giving back to our community in profound ways that are both piercing and compassionate. These qualities are an inspiration for all of us who work with him. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's too bad that Kellen's not here, and, and as Dorothy said, I'm, I'm glad that I got, uh, we, I got to meet Galen and do some work with, with him uh, in, in the 90s, late 90s, doing field work, and it's, uh, we're all thinking of Kellen right now. Um, so here's what uh, Kellen wrote in response to Arjun's very nice uh, address. I'm so honored to receive this award. Having one's name associated in any way with G.K. Gilbert and listed alongside the former recipients is incredible. It is humbling as well to think of the many scientists equally or more deserving of this honor. I am grateful to so many people, from friends and family that provided so much support, to mentors and advisors for challenging critiques, good guidance, wise words, encouragement at low points, and teaching by examples in so many ways. But science is not an individual sport, and this is not an award for individual accomplishments. This award belongs to the incredible group of scientists, post of students, postdocs, collaborators, and colleagues I have had the pleasure and luck to work with over the years. Each has contributed so much. It belongs also to my wife, Darla, and our two girls, Tegan and Darren, who have tolerated countless hours of physical or mental absence. This award celebrates all you have done, and I thank you all. On behalf of this amazing group, I thank the Earth and Planetary Surface Processes community for this honor. I especially thank Arjun Heimseth for the very kind words in the citation. Community is such an important aspect of the scientific endeavor. We are fortunate to have a vibrant, positive, and supporting community in surface processes. We owe a debt of thanks to all who have helped shape our community into what it is today. Maintaining a positive, collegial, yet scientifically challenging community is critical. Our community has one major problem to overcome, however. We are diversity challenged. We must all strive as best we can to do our part to rectify this shortcoming. Our community and the rate of scientific advance both would greatly benefit from a proactive focus on enhancing diversity. Thank you, Arjun and Noah. So, Um, we're now going to, to uh, do the citation and response for the Luna B. Leopold Early Career Award. And then um, just before we begin the sharp lecture then with the recipient of that award, we'll say a few closing remarks for the business meeting. All right. So the Luna B. Leopold Early Career Award is given annually to one early career scientist. It used to be no more than five years post degree, now it's 10. So many of you are now re-eligible Right? <laughs> in recognition of a significant and outstanding contribution, it's not plural, it could be one significant and outstanding contribution that advances the field of Earth and planetary surface processes. So this year's awardee is Joel Scheingrass, now at University of Nevada, Reno. And the citation was going to be read by Kellen. So I'm here to read that today. It is an honor and distinct pleasure to present Joel Scheingross as the recipient of the 2019 Luda B. Leopold Award. Through his multifaceted research, 
Joel has made fundamental advances in the understanding of sediment transport and incision by steep mountain rivers. The breadth of Joel's expertise is remarkable. His work encompasses detailed and carefully executed field work, designing and running clever laboratory experiments, and the testing, development, and refinement of relevant theory. Luna Leopold would approve. Joel's monitoring of fluvial processes and steep streams has taught us much about the relative contributions of form drag, relative roughness, channel slope, and grain hiding in determining initiation of motion thresholds. Following up this initial effort, Joel designed and executed a groundbreaking experimental study on the relative contributions of bed load and suspended load abrasion in bedrock channels, demonstrating that suspended load can dominate river incision by abrasion during large floods and steep rivers. That's amazing. Unsatisfied with just two fundamental contributions, Joel turned to the problem of waterfall erosion, again integrating novel experiments, theoretical developments, and field observations. Joel's work documents and quantifies waterfall retreat accomplished not by erosion on the waterfall face, nor by undermining due to scour and plunge pools or seepage erosion, but rather by the formation and downward drilling of new plunge pools upstream of the last. Importantly, this work indicates that commonly observed morphologies in bedrock channels may well have an autocyclic origin. They're not necessarily tied to local variations in substrate properties or driven by changes in boundary conditions as often envisioned. So this is truly a significant accomplishment. Final, finally, Joel gives selflessly to our community. And I can definitely back that up. He really has for EPSP, thank you. And even as a student, he was proactive in mentoring younger students. As the Leopold Award recipient, Joel stands as a role model to other young scientists beginning careers in the study of Earth, of earth surface processes. Thanks, guys. So uh, what makes this really special for me uh, is all of you in the room. And since I started uh, as an undergrad at Berkeley and Bill brought me into his world and the Berkeley grad students that were there at the time were supportive, uh, it seems every time I meet a new person in this community, people are nice and encouraging and respectful and give me ideas. Uh, and that was true when I, when I went to Caltech and worked with Mike Lamb, when I moved across the Atlantic to GFZ and, and worked with Niels Hovius to my new colleagues at University of Nevada, Reno, and, and even more so to all of you who I've never overlapped with. And I see here at this meeting, uh, you let me crash on your floor when I come through your town. Uh, you know, more than anything else, you make this uh, exciting community and you help me do better science, you challenge me. And um, yeah, I think it's, we have a really special community. So to be honored by all of you um, is incredibly touching and humbling. And I wanna, wanna thank all of you for just making such an awesome community. Uh, at the same time, I know not, not everyone has walked such a, a blissful path through this community, but there's so many of you out there who are working every day to try to make this community even better and more inclusive so that everyone has awesome experiences, and, and that's great. Um, so thank you. Joel, it's our distinct pleasure to offer you here the certificates that go with both the Luna B. Leopold Award and the Sharp Lecture Honor. It's also an honor to give the Sharp Lecture. All right. So. so um, will somebody please post that on Twitter? <laughs> All right, so Gordon's going to say a few words here. We'll do some closing remarks before we go to the Sharp Lecture in a few moments. Thank you, Dorothy, and con congratulations again to our award winners. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words about the larger context that we are all embedded in, and I don't mean the universe. I mean, well, 
it's AGU, so. Um, one of the other duties is required that both Dorothy and I share by virtue of being officers of the section is that we sit on the AGU council. And so we get to sort of watch how the sausage is made. Um, and without going into detail, this is not the time or place, I just want to alert and make sure our community is aware that AGU is going through a transition. Uh, it's a transition in terms of its conception of mission as revealed by things like strategic plans. It's going through a transition because the uh, Chris McEntee, who's been the CEO, is stepping down and therefore a new CEO will be hired and this actually changes the whole tone of the organization. And it's going through transition because of all the things that are going on in the broader society. And this is, an AGU is trying to figure out how to position itself and what its role is with respect to all these changes. And so I would encourage all of you to come if you have ideas, questions, concerns, uh, beliefs <laughs> about how AGU should function uh, in, the, in, in the modern age, please let us know because we, at, at the end of the day, it is a behemoth, but it is run by people and we can talk to those people. So please feel free to bring your ideas, your concerns and the like forward. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that important point. It is run by people and we as section members and leaders have a, a great opportunity to help um, determine what happens to us, um, how we grow and what kinds of things we do. Um, we only have a few moments before it's time to begin um, the Sharp Lecture to which we all look forward every year. But I did want to find out if anybody in the audience has one thing they want to say, you have a minute or so. Is there anything pressing I need to hear from anybody out there? You could have a chance for a moment. All right. And please email me or any of the other people you've met up here um, or heard from. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very good, Doug. Thanks. And could I have someone say a few words about Gilbert Club, an announcement about where to meet, um, what time it begins, who's speaking, for example? <laughs> I meant to include a slide here and I forgot to do that. We had a very busy day and I just didn't get it in. But perhaps, Bill, you could come up and say something? And then we'll begin the sharp lecture after that. And Joel, if you want, you can come up and we can get started getting it all set up if you'd like, because we have to find you on here. In general, I rec recommend more sleep, is my first recommendation. And then comes second, which is Gilbert Club, which I think most people know about, um, is taking place, it's returning to the Lawrence Hall of Science. So we have that cool lecture hall with the steep slope um, I, everyone this year registered through PayPal, um, and that was done to try to get into the meeting sooner. So we've done that, and you've ordered your sandwiches. That's fine. The, the, um, the transportation up is arranged. There will be a, uh, a bus every 15 minutes or so from the Ber Berkeley, uh, uh, downtown Berkeley BART station that will take you up in the hill. And um, there will be a bus departing late afternoon into the evening. So. We have a system because we try to imagine relying on Uber, Uber, no, Uber, and you'd have to have like 50 Uber drivers. So that's taken care of as well. The, and then what's really taken care of is we have 
a really great set of speakers who is going to um, inform us, I hope. <laughs> the first is Gordon Grant, who's going to tell us about everything we need to know about young volcanic terrains and the landscape evolution. And then Kimberly Hill, wherever she is, is going to bring us into the world of granular and debris flows. Um, we'll lunch, and after that, Mike Lamb is going to connect wildfires and debris flow mechanics. We'll have announcements from um, uh, the Justin Lawrence about the status of the geomorphology and land use dynamics program. Amy East will tell us about the current status of JGR Earth surface. And then, as always, there's pop-ups. And you will be asked when you arrive. Uh, Alex Brick will be there. Uh, Leonard Slar is the maestro. Uh, and so we'll ask for you to deliver PowerPoints when you arrive to get it all lined up so in the late in the day, we can have these great pop-ups that we'll have. So yes, it's pizza again at the end of the meeting. And yes, we get to go to a children's um, in, uh, kind of museum and there's things to play with uh, at night. But the virtual reality show is only available during the day. So if you want to experience the virtually, virtual reality display for young children, you'll have to sneak out during a break and play. Um, and are there any, any issue, logistic questions anybody want to ask? Yes. It is, we, yeah, uh, see me. We, we were kind of, the, we got leaned on a little harder this year about um, um, the fire marshal putting a seating capacity. But we have a dynamic group, so I, we sort of set it to a limit, and then I figured that people would contact me if they had great interest. And so if there are some of you who didn't get in or really keen to get in, we can do an accommodation with that way. So see me or email me. Uh, we ordered some extra sandwiches. We, it's, I'm trying to keep in the good stead of the Lawrence Hall of Science people, but we know people come late and some people leave early, and so we're, we're trying to do this, the, uh, the uh, solution function for a seat for everyone. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Bill. It's time now for the Sharp Lecture, so I'll turn it over to Joel. Uh, all right, so uh, starters, uh, is the, do we need to dim the lights? Can everyone see details? Someone want to give me a thumbs up? All right, I got, I got a thumbs up. Uh, cool. Um, I'm also getting over a cold, so hopefully my voice doesn't go. And I uh, was a little bit confused about the order of events, so I want to say thanks again to, to all of you. And this is a, an incomplete list, but it just is really humbling and touching that you guys want to take time out of a busy AGU week to come listen to me ramble. So I'm going to try and make it worthwhile for you, and we're going we're gonna to try and have some fun. Um, so climate tectonics topography, right? We all talk about this, but we, we talk about these interactions um, because it's, they're really understanding how these three things interact is absolutely fundamental, not just to geomorphology, but to all of the earth sciences. Um, and when we talk about climate tectonics and topography, we often talk about it in terms uh, of what I'll call the, the dominant paradigm. And that's that climate and tectonics are external forcings. Uh, and topography is some type of response variable, right? So tectonics creates topography. And I don't think anyone in this room would, would dispute that fact. Uh, similarly, climate modulates Earth's surface processes. And that, in turn, can influence topography. Um, I'm going to pop. Oh, found the projector. Um, so this is kind of the dominant paradigm. Of course, tectonics can modulate Earth's surface processes, and that affects topography as well. Um, but where I think some of the most exciting opportunities are in, in Earth and planetary surface processes, and where we've, I think, made a lot of progress in our community in, in the past decade or two, is when we break free from this dominant paradigm that we just have external forcing and some type of response, right? Um, Topography um, can modulate Earth's surface processes, and that can influence tectonics. And I put up one example from, from Sean Ouellette, but you can think about many people uh, in this room who are working on these processes. 
Uh, something else that I think is, is crazy and exciting is that Earth's surface processes can influence climate. And this is done primarily through weathering. We can change uh, silicate weathering. Uh, we can change the organic carbon cycle uh, through Earth's surface processes. And this can have a, a huge influence on climate. And, and topography can affect itself, right? There's internal system processes or autogenic dynamics uh, within Earth's surface processes. And this can actually modulate topography. And I put up a couple examples here from uh, William, Morris, William Morris Davis's 1909 geographical essays. And just thinking about what happens when you have a meandering river under constant forcing. You're not changing climate. You're not changing tectonics. And this meandering river is continuously incising. And you leave behind a series of terraces that might look like something that was created by some type of base level perturbation, change in climate, change in tectonics. But it's all this internal system dynamics and, or autogenic dynamics. Um, so really, you know, if we think about Earth history as a whole, and we, you know, we think big, the course of Earth history is charted in, in part, and maybe by large part, by this rich set of interactions between climate, tectonics, topography, and, and Earth's surface processes. So uh, that's a lot to talk about. Uh, and I'm not going to try to talk about all of that. And, and indeed, many of you sitting in the room work on these things. So I'm going to try to talk about a few aspects of that from my own work, uh, just as motivation to highlight some of these things that I think we as a community are doing that are exciting and fun. And I would in invite you all to join me in working on these problems if you're not already. So we're going to think about how Earth surface processes can influence climate and autogenic dynamics. So for this first idea, the first part of the talk, thinking about how Earth's surface processes can influence climate, I'm going to give you an example about lowland rivers and thinking about how the storage of organic carbon in lowland river networks might influence climate. And in the second part of the talk, we're going to focus on autogenic dynamics. And we're going to think about how creating waterfall plunge pools, like you can see in this image, might actually change uh, river profile concavity over kilometer uh, spatial scales in the absence of any changes in climate or tectonics. So uh, let's zoom in to the first part of the talk. Uh, lots of collaborators here uh, and various people who have helped me along the way. Uh, this is all work that I did as part of my postdoc at the GFZ, uh, working with Niels Hovius. Um, and again, the idea here is to try to link aspects of Earth's surface processes and how that might actually modulate climate. Uh, and to make sure we're all on the same page, I, I want to start by just talking about what actually is going to control atmospheric CO2 levels over geologic timescales, over million-year timescales. And I'm going to put up this 600 gigatons of carbon. This is the reservoir or the pre-industrial reservoir of carbon in Earth's atmosphere. And I want to think about how this is modulated over million-year timescales in a source-to-sink style framework. And if we want to increase carbon in the atmosphere, an easy way to do it is through solid earth degassing. Right? We can have volcanism and metamorphism, and that's going to flux CO2 to the atmosphere. If we want to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, a great way to do that is through silicate weathering. We can uplift a granitic mountain range. We can weather silicate minerals couple that to carbonate precipitation in the ocean, and we can bring down CO2. And indeed, lots of people in our community have looked at the intricacies between uh, variations in climate and tectonics and how that might affect rates of silicate weathering and influence atmospheric CO2 levels over long time scales. Uh, I'm not going to get into silicate weathering today. What I want to talk about is the organic carbon cycle. And the organic carbon cycle is really exciting because it can be both a source of CO2 to the atmosphere over geologic time scales and a sink of CO2 to the atmosphere over geologic time scales. And it depends on what type of organic carbon we're talking about. And I'll differentiate between rock-derived or petrogenic organic carbon. So I really do mean rock-derived. You know, think about shales. Think about fossil fuels. Uh, when we have organic carbon that's trapped in the rock record, uh, and then we weather it. If we uplift uh, a mountain range made of sedimentary rock and we start weathering it, we're going to take carbon that's trapped in the rock record. Uh, we're going to release it to the atmosphere. 
and that's going to provide a long-term source of CO2 to the atmosphere. We can contrast this with the organic carbon that might be more familiar to you, and that's what we have in, in biomass and in soils and shallow sedimentary deposits. Here, if we take carbon that's stored in biomass, we erode it into a river, and we flux it out to a depositional basin where we bury it and create new rock, then we're taking carbon from the atmosphere, we're putting it into biomass um, transiently, and then turning it into the rock. So it's a long-term sink of CO2 from the atmosphere. And I've put up these different, these different bubbles here, and these is, this is the size of the um, biospheric organic carbon terrestrial res reservoir, petrogenic organic carbon, and an atmosphere. And what you can see is these uh, terrestrial pools of organic carbon are a lot larger than the pre-industrial levels of carbon in the atmosphere. And what that means is that if we have small changes in the size of these terrestrial pools, we can have potentially large impacts on atmospheric CO2 levels. And the reason I'm excited to talk to all of you about this is because the size of these pools are controlled in part, and I would argue in large part, by Earth's surface processes. And this is something that I think all of us in this room have something to contribute to, to think about how these, the size of these pools change and apply our techniques. Uh, and I can't talk about all of our surf, Earth's surface processes today, but what I do want to zoom in on is talk about lowland rivers and how lowland rivers might control the size of these pools by setting the flux and the transit time of organic carbon to depositional basins. Um, so simply put, when we think about lowland rivers, this is the Rio Bermejo in northern Argentina, where I've been thinking about this, uh, the ability to oxidize or preserve organic carbon in lowland rivers like this may be a major control on atmospheric CO2 levels over geologic time scales. Um, but I want to argue to you that there's, if we want to link geomorphic processes uh, and geochemical processes and actually predict the fate of organic carbon, through lowland river networks, there's a major knowledge gap we need to overcome. And that knowledge gap is that we need to understand where is organic carbon oxidized and where is organic carbon preserved in lowland river networks. And what I mean by that is what happens when organic carbon is transiently stored in floodplains? Is this a good place to oxidize or preserve organic carbon? And it could be a good place to oxidize organic carbon because organic carbon typically travels with the sediment load, and sediment spends most of its time uh, in transient storage in floodplains as it journeys from source to sink. So we have a lot of time spent in floodplains, but the kinetics of reactions might be slow. We can bury organic carbon deep in the floodplain, could have um, anoxic conditions, uh, and maybe, maybe we're preserving organic carbon in the floodplain. And we can contrast this with what's happening when we're actually in the river, and in the river, sediment and organic carbon doesn't spend, spends a very small fraction of its time on its journey from source to sink, but the kinetics are potentially fast because turbulence is bringing oxygen into the system, so we can have, um, we can oxidize the organic carbon that's there. And what I want to do in the first part of this talk is walk through a testable hypothesis, and I'm going to hypothesize that all the action is in the floodplains. That is, organic carbon oxidation occurs predominantly during floodplain storage, and basically nothing happens in the rivers. When we, there's just short, too short of time scales, and there's no organic carbon oxidation when we're in active transport in the river. Uh, you could flip this around the other way. It's just a testable hypothesis I want to walk through. And I'm going to walk through it by first taking you to the Rio Bermejo and trying to isolate floodplain oxidation. Uh, and then I want to take you to the lab and do some small-scale experiments where we're going to isolate the potential for organic carbon oxidation in river transport in the absence of floodplain storage. Uh, so let's start uh, with the first part of this, and we're going to go to the Rio Bermejo. We're here in northern Argentina. This is a, a Google Earth image, and I know it's hard to see the river on here, so I'll, I'll add it on. We're, the Bermejo drains the eastern flank of the Andes, runs out to the Rio Paraguay. And if we zoom in on one section of the river, this is another Google Earth image, you can see the Bermejo here going from left to right. Uh, it's, a, it's a lowland meandering river. It's sweeping back and forth, actually quite rapidly, across an active channel belt. 
But from time to time, the Bermejo avulses, uh, and it goes to new places on the fluvial megafan that it's forming. Uh, and, it, and when it avulses, it leaves behind these abandoned paleo channels that you can see here. Um, and this is important because it means that in this system, we can go look at what's happening in the modern river, and we can look at floodplains of different ages and essentially create a chrono sequence where we can look how organic carbon uh, load composition, um, the, the amount of organic carbon, is changing with time spent in floodplain storage. Um, so I'm going to walk you through one cross section of the river where I've done this and tried to create one of these chrono sequences. And we go out uh, onto the river and we sample depth profiles of bed load and suspended sediment throughout the water column. Should point out this is Marissa Rapash here, who's a graduate student at the Gay FZ, who's been working with me on this project uh, more or less since the beginning. And uh, much of the work I'm presenting today is shared with her. Um, so we go out in the field, we collect sediment from the river. This is really our baseline. This is, we can look at the organic carbon composition of sediment in the river, and it tells us what we're feeding into the floodplains. This is our input into the floodplains. And then we can go out to the floodplains, as Niels Hovius and Hima Hasenruck Gudapati are doing in this photo, and we can use a hand auger. Uh, it's a bit hard to see. This is a five meters high. Niels is, is two meters per, per scale here. And we can, dr we can drill down into the floodplain uh, and actually collect samples of organic carbon stored in the floodplain and compare that with what's in the active river. And doing this at a couple locations, we create this chrono sequence where we have our baseline coming out of the river and then a, about a 700-year-old floodplain and a 3,000-year-old floodplain. Um, and so when we look at the organic carbon composition or concentration from these different sources, I want to plot the results on axes that I'm showing you here where POC on the Y here, this is particulate organic carbon weight percent. So it's really uh, the concentration of organic carbon that we have in the sediment. And I'm just going to plot it against median grain size, or, or D50, on the x-axis. And the reason I want to use these particular set of axes is because we often see an inverse relationship between POC and grain size. That is, when we have relatively fine grains, things like clays, uh, we have high surface area to volume ratios. We tend to absorb a lot of organic carbon onto here and get high POC loading. Um, so with this in mind, if we see our data plotting something like this, where for a single grain size, as we go to older and older deposits, or more and more time spent in floodplain storage, we're getting less and less POC concentrations, this would imply floodplain oxidation, right? The more time we spend in storage, the, the lower quantity of organic carbon we have relative to our input. Whereas if we see the data all plotting on top of each other, this might imply that we're not oxidating, oxidizing organic carbon in the floodplain, that it's being preserved. Um, so with that in mind, let's, let's actually look at some data. So the axes here are the same. We still have POC on the Y, grain size on the X. And this is actively transported sediment from the river. And you can see we're recovering this inverse relationship between POC and grain size. So again, this is really our input into the floodplains. If we go to a 700-year-old floodplain deposit that I'm showing here in blue, this is what we get. Here's the 3,000-year-old floodplain deposit. And what you can see is that, especially at finer grain sizes, as we spend more and more time in floodplain storage, we're going to lower POC levels. And this is about a 60 to 70% loss of POC with order 3,000 years of floodplain storage. This isn't unique to this cross-section of the river. We repeated this exercise at another cross-section about 200 kilometers downstream of here, and we see something very similar. The axes on this plot are the same. This is still POC on the Y, grain size on the X. The color coding is similar, too. These are actively transported river sediments. These are floodplains, uh, a bit younger. This is five to 700-year-old floodplain deposits. But again, what we're seeing is this kind of 40 to 60% loss of POC uh, with order 500,000 years of floodplain storage. Um, so this decrease of POC with increasing deposit age suggests that we have efficient floodplain oxidation up to about five meters depth. That's how deep we can get with this hand auger when we go core the floodplain. 
This is also about one channel depth in the Bermejo. So as this river is sweeping back and forth across its floodplain, um, we're, if it doesn't come back to an area within about 1,000 years, we've lost a substantial portion of organic carbon and respired that back to the atmosphere. I'll point out this idea of floodplain oxidation is also supported by looking at the stable carbon isotopes and radiocarbon in these deposits. I don't have time to show you that data today, but if you're interested in it, uh, come find me afterwards or, or ask me afterwards, and I'm happy to show you some of that data. Um, so cool, there's a lot happening in the floodplain. Uh, it seems like it's a hotbed of organic carbon uh, oxidation. What's happening uh, in the river? And it's really hard to isolate the role of oxidation of organic carbon in river transport alone in the field, and that's because lowland rivers are migrating and you're constantly mixing sediment that's been stored for some amount of time in the floodplain with what's in the channel. So instead of going to the field, I wanna take you to the lab. And these are my annular flume experiments. So this is just a donut or ring-shaped flume. You're seeing a paddle wheel that's driving the flow. Here's some sand moving through it in this example. And we can take this flume, we can load it with organic carbon-rich sediment, let it crank for a month, and look to see if we lose any organic carbon when we're transporting carbon long distances, importantly, with zero floodplain storage, right? We can transport sediment from the Vermejo, a thousand kilometers, the length of the channel, with zero floodplain storage. Uh, when I run these experiments, I actually use stainless steel flumes like you can see over here. Uh, and this is because um, uh, the acrylic flumes are nice for monitoring the hydrodynamics, but we don't want any contamination from organics in our experiments. Uh, there's 12 experiments here, transporting a range of different types of organic carbon, both from the Bermejo and other sources of biospheric and petrogenic organic carbon, just trying to look across a range of different types of carbon to see um, if there's an effect. Uh, importantly, all of these sediments we go collect in the field, they're natural sediments, they come with native microbial communities. Oxidation of organic carbon is often microbially mediated. We've done nothing here to promote a specific microbial community. The hope is that by bringing in natural sediments with their own microbial communities, we have the, mi the right microbes in there that want to eat and respire the carbon that's in the experiment. We run these about a month, transport sediment, order a thousand kilometers. Uh, and importantly, um, you know, I want to emphasize these experiments don't replicate nature. They're designed to isolate variables. And here we're really trying to isolate the role of physical sediment transport in the absence of floodplain storage and look at how that might affect organic carbon oxidation. Uh, when I show you results from these experiments, I'll do it on these plots of, again, particulate organic carbon weight percent on the Y versus time on the X. And time, of course, scales with transport distance. So when you see data plotting along a straight line in this space, it means that as we transport particles further or we spend more time in the flume, um, POC is staying constant, so there's no oxidation of organic carbon. Whereas if, when you see a decrease in POC with time, as in this blue line here, this implies that there is in-river oxidation, right? We spend more time in the flume and transport, we have less POC. Um, so let's look at some data. So here's the experiment for the Rio Bermejo. Again, POC on the Y, time in the experiment on the, on the X. And this is this order 40 to 70% loss of POC that we're seeing in the floodplains. And what I want to show you is now uh, the POC concentration at the start and end of this experiment. And that's these gray diamonds here. And what you can see is the starting composition of POC that we input into the flume is the same as the ending composition of POC that we pull out of the flume, implying no in-river oxidation of organic carbon. Uh, this isn't true in just this experiment. If we look at a lignite, we have no oxidation of uh, particulate organic carbon. Here's a shale experiment where we shift shale to four different grain sizes to look if there is a grain size effect, and we see no oxidation or no in-river oxidation of organic carbon, same as in O-horizon soil. Um, so going back to this testable hypothesis, where's all the action? Uh, is it in the floodplain? Is it in the river? Well, when we went to the river and tried to isolate floodplain oxidation, we saw that there's a progressive uh, increase in organic carbon oxidation with increasing time spent in floodplain storage. Whereas when we went to the lab and looked to see what was happening in the river, 
we saw no detectable POC losses despite order 1,000 kilometers of fluvial sediment transport. So it seems like this hypothesis is, is more or less holding up. Um, so uh, what does that mean for how Earth's surface processes might actually influence climate, right? This is this broader thing I, I want to get back to. And I want to come back to this idea that small changes in the size of the terrestrial organic carbon pool can have potentially large impacts on atmospheric CO2 levels. And I hope what I've shown you in this, this one example is that in lowland rivers, uh, floodplain residence time may actually regulate the size of the terrestrial organic carbon pool. Uh, and importantly, floodplain residence time is set by feedbacks that the people in this room know a lot about. And those are feedbacks between autogenic dynamics and external forcing. And I'll just give you one example here. If we think about sediment supply, um, sediment supply responds to changes in climate and tectonics in ways that many of us characterize. Uh, it also influences lateral migration rate and avulsion frequency. And this really creates nonlinear feedbacks uh, between these external perturbations, storage times in floodplains, and potentially atmospheric CO2 concentrations. Um, so uh, this is, uh, there's, there's a really rich set of interactions here, and I would, I would encourage you all to think about them because I think we, uh, as geomorphologists, can offer unique insights into these systems. So I want to transition now to the, the second part of the talk, and I want to focus a little bit more on the role of autogenic dynamics, and that is how Earth's surface processes uh, may actually influence topography. Uh, and I'm going to do that um, with one example where I'm going to think about how autogenic dynamics may set bedrock river profile form. Uh, what I'm showing you today is work with, with many collaborators that's been supported by NSF, NASA, Caltech, and University of Nevada, Reno. This is both work that came out of my PhD, working with Michael Lamb at Caltech, uh, and also new work that I've been developing at, at UNR with collaborators and students there. Um, and before, before I really dig into the work, I want to start with this Google Earth image. So this is the New England Tableland in Southeast Australia. Uh, this is a fairly dramatic landscape, and I hope the first thing that really jumps out at you when you see this is the stark contrast between uh, this low relief surface in the background here and these deeply incised canyons in the foreground. Uh, and what's happened here is that rifting off the, uh, off the Australian continent has created relief, and, and that relief um, has propagated inland, right? There's been some type of tectonic forcing. This is propagating inland. And if we zoom in at these channel heads here, what we see are landscapes that, that look like this, um, where we have uh, a steep section of channel with multiple waterfalls. Here's one, there's some more waterfalls back here that are going up to this lower relief uh, planar surface. And we tend to often call these steep channel sections nick zones, and I'm going to use the term nick zones throughout the talk uh, to talk about um, these types of perturbations. Uh, and looking at river profiles with nick zones or nick points has been really instrumental to our understanding of tectonic geomorphology uh, because of this idea that we can reconstruct or invert river profiles to determine the magnitude or timing of external perturbation. So we have some river profile, there's some nick point here or nick zone, uh, and we can, we can actually, um, in various ways, invert this for when there was some external perturbation. And, and I want to be clear here that our community has learned a lot from doing this uh, and has really developed a way to read aspects of changes in Earth history that are encoded in topography. Uh, but importantly, when we do this, uh, when we invert river profiles uh, with nick zones, we're, we're assuming, uh, and sometimes with good reason, that these nick zones arise from some type of perturbation in external forcing. And the question I want to ask today is whether or not these nick zones can form autogenically, uh, and if we can create big changes in river profile concavity in the absence of changes in climate or tectonics, uh, but that might look like we had a change in climate or tectonics. And I'm going to offer you a hypothesis. Um, and I would love your feedback uh, when I see you at Gilbert Club or after the talk on if you buy this hypothesis. So here's my idea. 
I want to start with the idea that a uh, series of waterfalls, like we can see here, are analogous to something like current ripples in uh, this dry riverbed. That waterfalls are simply bedrock bed forms, and they can arise on their own, that they can self-form. Now, importantly, creating one, two, three, four waterfalls does not create a nick zone that's kilometers long, that when we go to a 90 meter DEM and ex export a river profile, we're not going to mistake a single waterfall as an external perturbation. These waterfalls do not represent individual pulses of uplift. But when we create waterfalls, when we go from a bedrock riverbed that uh, is more or less planar to one that has a series of steps and pools, I'm gonna argue to you that we fundamentally change the processes of erosion, right? We have a big waterfall jet here going into a plunge pool, and that should produce different erosion rates than we would get from having a planar river reach where we don't have big waterfall jets. And if that's true, if, if a series of waterfalls can self-form and arise spontaneously as bedrock bed forms, and if they can fundamentally change the erosion rates relative to what we had before, then if this happens, even without a change in climate or tectonics or any type of external perturbation, uh, we're going to set up spatial variability and erosion rates, and this can then propagate throughout the river profile and actively act to change river profile concavity or slope over really large spatial scales, uh, and this might look like an external perturbation to the landscape. So let's walk through this hypothesis. So can waterfalls form as bedrock bed forms? Are they, are they analogous to these current ripples? Uh, it's not such a crazy idea. Here's a nice experiment from Taki and Parker in, in 2005, and they, along with others, have shown that alluvial riverbeds tend to be unstable at steep slopes with supercritical flow. So this is thin flow over a bed of loose sediment at the start of the experiment, and it breaks down into a series of steps and pools. Uh, this is commonly called cyclic step formation, and it's quite well documented in loose and cohesive sediments. And indeed, when I go out to the mountains and, and I hike through bedrock channels, I often see that waterfalls form in series, often with characteristic heights and periodic spacing that suggests that they might be analogous um, to these bed forms that we get in alluvial rivers. So one way that we can actually test this idea and, and see if these features can self-form or arise uh, autogenically uh, is to go to the lab and see if we can actually make these bed forms in the lab without changing uh, external forcing. So I'm going to show you the results of one experiment. Um, we're using an eight meter long flume. We're tilting this to about 20% slope. We're giving it a constant supply of water and gravel. This is the start of the experiment here. You can see gravel saltating down the flume. We're going to scale this similar to mountain streams where we have turbulent supercritical flow. And, and the pink stuff that you see here is a polyurethane foam, and its abrasion rate scales like bedrock. That is, it follows the, the relationship from Sklar and Dietrich 2001 between volumetric erosion rate and tensile strength. Um, so basically, we're going to start with this planar bed. We're going to hold everything constant, and we're going to see how it evolves with time. Uh, so I'll show you the results of this experiment on these plots of elevation. Uh, on the Y versus distance on the X. So this is just a long profile through the flume. The blue here is this initial planar bedrock uh, reach, um, and the, the black is the bottom of the flume. So here's the first one and a half hours of the experiment, and what you can see is immediately where the river doesn't want to be planar. We're breaking it down into a series of kind of shoots and pools and making this wavy topography. If we go two and a half hours into the experiment, these chutes and pools are growing in amplitude. Uh, we're creating hydraulic jumps where we're separating supercritical flow upstream from subcritical flow downstream. And if I zoom in on this section of the channel, here we are 2.7 hours into the experiment. And the shading that you can see here is when we start to deposit uh, some gravel in the flume. Uh, and this is really important because this gravel layer is providing uh, a sediment cover. And this cover is preventing erosion of, of this um, pool here, whereas this pool downstream of here is still free to erode. It has no cover. 
So the relief between these two pools can grow with time as we shut off um, erosion in this pool due to the sediment cover, but allow erosion to continue in this pool. And if we go to the next time step, uh, you can see we've, we've drilled down in this downstream pool and we continue to accumulate sediment in this pool. Uh, and in the end, that results in forming a waterfall, which we've defined as the point where the water jet actually physically detaches from the surface of the flume. There's a, there's a gap there back here that's a bit hard to see. And this happened at this location in the flume that I'm showing you here, and also at one location uh, a meter or two downstream of here. So going back to this idea of our series of waterfalls analogous uh, to, to ripples are these bedrock bed forms, I would say the preliminary experiment and the prevalence of repeating waterfalls with a kind of characteristic morphology suggests that waterfalls can form autogenically. Uh, so if that's true, what about this idea that when we go from a planar bedrock reach to one made up of a series of waterfalls, that we change bedrock erosion rates? Uh, Let's dig into that. Uh, to do that, we first need to think about how waterfalls erode. And if we're thinking about places where we have series of waterfall erosion, or series of waterfalls, uh, the mechanism we're going to use for waterfall erosion and retreat is one after Alan Howard that he put forward in the mid 1990s. That's we have a series of waterfalls with plunge pools, and each of these plunge pools are drilling down vertically, and we have some mechanism that's creating new waterfalls at the substream lip. So with time, as we keep creating new waterfalls and waterfall plunge pools continue to drill down vertically, we get a net sense of escarpment retreat. So what I want to do is take this model of waterfall erosion and compare it to what we would get uh, to an escarpment with the same relief, but where we put in a planar bed without any waterfalls. And we're going to model waterfall erosion um, using a, a process-based model that I spent most of my PhD trying to develop where we can account for things like rock properties, sediment size, waterfall and plunge pool geometry, geez, uh, and more. And we're gonna compare that to what you would do in a landscape evolution modeling context, which is just using stream power. And we can look at how accounting for a waterfall formation might give us different erosion rates than we would get with stream power. So, um, Let's look at some predictions. I'm going to put Nick's zone retreat rate on the Y here, and I'm going to compare that to the relief of Nick's zones. And I'm going to change Nick's zone relief. Uh, basically, uh, just change the relief while holding the length constant. So higher relief Nick's zones uh, means that they're steeper. And this is the prediction of the stream power model. It's not very sensitive to changing relief because uh, stream power is predicting vertical incision in this case. And when you get uh, high relief and steep nick zones, that vertical incision doesn't efficiently translate into horizontal nick zone retreat. Uh, and here's one of the predictions from the waterfall model. If we vary nick zone relief by making more waterfalls that are more closely spaced uh, when we go to higher relief. Uh, here's another prediction. If we vary nick zone relief by making taller waterfalls with constant spacing. And the main point I want to get across here is that when we account for some of the physics of waterfall erosions, we get fairly different predictions, that we need a threshold relief to start producing erosion, and then we get erosion rates that can be both less than and greater than uh, what we get with stream power. So again, really just using these process-based rules uh, gives us that accounting for waterfalls can give us erosion rates uh, that are both slower and faster than what we would get in the absence of waterfalls. And, you know, this is a, a log log plot. So we can get differences, you know, up to a factor of five, maybe even greater. Um, and I should also mention that this idea that waterfalls can retreat both uh, faster and slower than uh, step free reaches is supported by some really nice field work that Roman DiBiase uh, put out in a paper in, in 2015. Uh, and um, I also want to say uh, Roman has been a, a tremendous support in providing ideas as I've helped think through some of these processes. Um, okay, so can Nixones form autogenically? We said waterfalls might be bedrock bed forms, and we, uh, I glossed over a lot of the details of the mechanics behind here, but a process-based model says that waterfall formation 
basically fundamentally changes erosion rates to what we get in the absence of waterfalls. So I want to finish up by saying when we put these together, can we actually create large-scale changes uh, in river profiles that might look like some type of climate or tectonic perturbations? And warning, this is now all work in progress. So we're jumping off, jumping off the deep end, and what you're seeing has been, been cooked up over the past three or four months. Um, and so the idea here is to really incorporate waterfalls into some type of long profile evolution model. And ideally, we would want to do that by bringing in all the physics. But as many of you sitting in the room know, it's, it's quite hard to bring in all the physics to a long profile evolution model. And this is work in progress. So I'm going to try to uh, you know, do the thing that I think any of you would try to do if you were asked to give this lecture, which is say, oh, shoot. How can I do something cool in a quick way and see if this is a good idea? Um, and the idea here is going to be that we expect autogenic waterfalls will preferentially occur at steeper slopes. Like this, see, this, I hope this makes intuitive sense, right? We see waterfalls in the mountains. Mountain streams tend to be steep. Uh, when we have a lot of relief, like we have in steep streams, we have space to form waterfalls. And importantly, uh, when we have steep streams, we can get fruit supercritical flow, which is one of the predictions that we need to form cyclic steps uh, from the alluvial literature. So we're going to, uh, and I should say, this is also supported by, by preliminary field data. Uh, this is work that Erica Groh, who's a grad student working with me at UNR, has put together. And what Erica's plotting here is the fraction of relief from waterfalls in a given drainage network. So higher numbers here means we have more waterfalls. And this is the slope of the trunk channel in degrees. And what you can see is there's a big increase in the fraction of relief of waterfalls uh, at about five or six degrees here, uh, suggesting that maybe there's some hypothetical threshold slope for autogenic waterfall formation. So can we take this idea that perhaps waterfalls turn on at the threshold slope and just plug that into a simple kinematic um, you know, stream power type model. And this is work that's been, uh, that I've done with Scott McCoy and Sophie Rothman, who's another grad student working with both Scott and I at UNR, has been pushing forward. So we're going to take a uh, stream power model that we all uh, know and love, uh, and we're going to add a rate constant, uh, F, that's a waterfall erosion rate constant in front of here. Um, and we're going to set F equal to 1 when we have slopes below the critical slope for waterfall formation. So that is, if we're at low slopes, we're just going to assume pure stream power uh, that we've been, been doing for decades. Uh, but importantly, when we go to high slopes, when we exceed this critical value, we're going to let F vary. It's no longer going to equal 1 uh, because we know that when we form waterfalls, we can get erosion rates that differ by factor of two or five uh, from what we get with stream power. So I want to walk you through one of these models. We're going to do a case of fast waterfall erosion. So this is, this is a long profile here uh, that was evolved under normal stream power. So this is what we would get setting F equal to one, uh, just total steady state stream, erosion equals uplift. And on the left side here, we're below the critical slope. We have no waterfalls. On the right side here, we're above the critical slope. And what we're going to do is set F equal to 1 in this reach. We're going to keep stream power as normal. And then in this reach, we're going to say waterfalls erode fast. And we're going to let them erode twice as fast uh, as you would have in the absence of waterfalls and see how this affects river profile form. And this is what it looks like. Uh, as, you, um, as this plays out, you eventually evolve to a new steady state where you've lowered the slope um, without changing uplift, without changing climate, uh, simply because in this section of the channel, waterfalls can erode faster. So to keep up with the same uplift rate, we don't need as steep of slopes in the stream power model. I also want to show you the results of this simulation. Instead of in long profile form, I want to show you slope on the y-axis versus distance from the outlet because I think it highlights some of the really cool things we see in this profile. And that's that, you know, again, below the critical slope, uh, we just have normal stream power. Uh, slope is increasing as we move upstream. But then we get this reach where slope is constant. 
we get a completely planar reach here, uh, which is in a dynamic equilibrium. The slope is equal to the critical slope. We have waterfalls turning on, lowering the slope just below the critical, uplift brings it back, and uh, we're, we're ricocheting about through here. And then in the furthest upstream reach, we get a decrease of slope because waterfalls can erode faster than the normal stream power model. Um, so this is cool because this is a testable hypothesis that we can then take out to the field and see if we see um, river profiles that look like this and if they have waterfalls and where they have waterfalls. And we can do this not just for this fast erosion case. Uh, I'll show you one more example where what if we do slow erosion? So the same setup here, this is another long profile, uh, generic stream power steady state, erosion equals uplift. Uh, and now we're going to let it evolve, where we're going to keep stream power uh, below the critical slope. Uh, but in the upper parts of the reach, we're going to say that waterfalls erode slow, and we're going to decrease erosion rates now by a factor of two, and look at how the profiles evolve. And when we do that, these are the results. Uh, that as we move forward, uh, slopes increase, and we eventually reach a new steady state where we've increased slope by a factor of two uh, due to waterfalls eroding slow. Um, so again, this is our normal stream power reach, and when we turned on waterfalls, we transitioned to a steeper slope because waterfalls erode slow, um, so we need to increase the slope in a stream power type model to keep up with erosion rates. Um, so, again, this is showing us that it might be possible for autogenic dynamics to change profile slope over quite large spatial scales in the absence of external perturbations, and I think simple models like this are really useful to provide testable hypotheses and ideas we can work through to take out into nature. And, you know, of course, uh, I'm doing the absolute simplest case that we can do. Uh, in reality, um, we don't have landscapes that start in one stream power steady state and we magically turn on waterfalls, right? In landscapes we go out to, we have a combination of autogenic dynamics and external forcing that are acting together, and that can create really complicated river profiles and, and more, and that's what makes this a rich and exciting problem. And I think, uh, you know, simple tools like this are a start of ways that we can start trying to bring in some more physics uh, and start thinking about some of these processes. Um, so, uh, you know, can Nick zones form autogenically? We walked through this hypothesis, uh, and it seems like waterfalls can form as bedrock bed forms. I think it should make intuitive sense that when we make waterfalls, we have potential to fundamentally change, change erosion rates uh, because we're changing processes. And this is supported by a process-based model. And uh, the kind of the simplest modeling we can do suggests that if we change erosion rates, we might get large-scale changes in river profile concavity that might look like things that could emerge from some perturbation in climate or tectonics. So I think based on our current knowledge, this hypothesis seems plausible. I think there's still a lot of work to do to really flush this out. And, and that's part of ongoing work uh, in my group right now. So, um, you know, again, the, the last 20 minutes has been one example of how Earth surface processes and autogenic dynamics is influencing topography. But in reality, you know, we have to think about all of these things because there is no landscape that exists in isolation without external forcings, without internal system dynamics, and without complicated uh, responses. And I think that's what makes this uh, a rich and exciting field to, to work in. Um, so I want to really wrap up with, with two quick thoughts. And that's that I think ultimately um, one of the most exciting things where I see us going as a community is trying to develop mechanistic understandings of this interplay between both uh, internal system processes, earth surface processes, autogenic dynamics, and the combined influence of external forcing. And by thinking about both of these processes, I think that's really going to allow us to improve our understanding of Earth history and to read Earth history from the landscape. Um, uh, and we don't want to just read Earth history from the landscape, but thinking about what's happening with the carbon cycle, there's really a tremendous opportunity for us as geomorphologists 
to employ, you know, employ our knowledge of how landscapes evolve to think about critical questions that aren't things we might normally think about, but can be really useful to other fields. Uh, and carbon cycling is, is one example, and, and there are more. And you know, I'm really sincere that this is cool and, and, and important, and I hope this talk has provided some motivation for you to think about how you can employ what, what you're doing uh, and what's happening in your group to help answer some of these questions. So with that, I want to thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Joel. So yes, we have time for questions. And please stand up and say your question loudly. So with the person right here, go ahead. Right. And face the audience a little bit if you can. Thanks. Torsten, do you, do you want to use the microphone? I think some people in the back probably can't hear you, and it sounds like you're going to be, be long enough that I'm going to have a hard time repeating it all. Also stall for time. All right. Um, yeah, so my question is about uh, the first part of the talk about the POC burial going from the uh, modern river into the subsurface. Um, I don't think I heard you talk about the groundwater table. That seems like, like the critical boundary between you know, rapid oxidation and, and you know, transitioning into maybe something like more permanent burial. Could you maybe comment yeah, on Yeah, no, 100% um, agree with you. Uh, everything that I was talking about were all deposits above the modern groundwater table. Um, and we went down to about a channel depth, which is what we could do in this landscape. And when we're above the groundwater table, we have oxid conditions, things tend to get oxidized. Certainly, if you're below the groundwater table, you're much more likely to have an oxid conditions. Uh, Kristen Boy at Stanford has a nice paper that came out in Nature Geosciences a couple years ago, where she showed preservation below the groundwater table. 100% uh, right, and let me emphasize, this is something that I think we can work on as this community. If we make floodplain evolution models where we're tracking the sedimentary architecture, the grain size, where the groundwater table is through time, we can map out where organic carbon is going to be oxidized, where it's going to be preserved, and think about what these effects on long-term timescales are, and how when we hit that with changes in climate and tectonics or autogenic dynamics, what's going to happen. Uh, great fundamental question waiting to be answered um, and really important that I think we can make progress on. Yeah, thanks. I totally agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So if you want to do that, you should, uh, you know, do it. Like, it's cool. Um, I did not say that. <laughs> and if others have questions, please get lined up over there and then we can just do you in sequence. I'm trying to avoid taking Doug's questions, so please quickly go to the microphone. <laughs> no, Doug, Doug, please come up. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess, you know, the thing that strikes me most with that question is to put it back in the context of the saltation abrasion model. So think about the Sklar and Dietrich 2004 paper. And, and that paper argues that when you have long saltation hop lengths, um, then you should reduce erosion rates. And, and this is essentially, I, I think, what you're getting at, Doug. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, um, 
Well, I think that that paper has, has been absolutely fundamental. Um, Mike Lamb did a nice job, together with Leonard and Bill, uh, recasting that model in terms of a concentration framework instead of a saltation hop length framework. And when you do that, even as you increase transport stage, uh, you tend not to get decreases in erosion rate because you're still having high concentrations of particles near the bed, and you're increasing impact velocity near the bed, and that keeps producing erosion rates. So fundamentally, I, I don't think that it should be a saltation hop length type of phenomenon. OK, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm really interested in the second part. Uh, so this might be a very dumb question, but uh, what is autogenic processes? Yeah, so uh, uh, y I'll just give one additional comment. Uh, so when I was talking to Chris Pilla, um we were discussing about autogenic processes. And uh, his opinion is that uh, autogenic processes are dynamics going on when the system is in equilibrium. The problem is. Uh, how do you know it's in equilibrium? Yeah, and I guess, you know, to me, um, I'm not sure that it, it matters so much what we call it. The point that I, I want to make is that there are, there are complicated nonlinear feedbacks. Uh, and this is really the, the essence of morphodynamics to me. Um, and those feedbacks are, we see when we hold things constant that they're complicated when we hold them constant, when a system's in equilibrium, like mm -hmm. you say. When we perturb a system, we don't turn off morphodynamics. I think, in fact, we tend to make things more complicated. We, we put in base level fall, you know, we change climate. We still have all those morphodynamic feedbacks now acting on top of an external forcing. So I don't know if, if I answered your question, but when I talk about autogenic dynamics, mm -hmm. I, I really kind of mean morphodynamic feedbacks that, that can operate independent of changes in things like uh, discharge or base level uh, or you know, changing grain size through changing uplift rates or things like this. Do, does that get to your question? OK, uh, I'll just get one more additional uh, comment uh, and hope, hope you guys bear with me. Uh, so in system dynamics theory uh, and in some modeling work, if you perturb a landscape, uh, say a step change in its uplift rate, uh, what you can observe at the drainage basin outlet is uh, steadily increasing sediment flux. And uh, uh, that's the system adjusting to the uh, changing uplift rate. So. Uh, is, is this process uh, you would also consider as uh, autogenic or maybe a response to the perturbation? Uh, let me make sure I, let me repeat your question and see if I understand it. Your question is, if we change uplift rate yep. and sediment flux at the outlet of a basin increases mm -hmm. because we changed uplift rate, yes, uh, you're asking if that's uh, due to external forcing or due to autogenic dynamics? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think on the whole, um, you change uplift rates and you see an increase in sediment supply. Um, that is external forcing. Um, right. But the, you know, probably the magnitude of that change, uh, the time series of sediment supply out of the basin, these type of properties, uh, what regulates them will be how much you change that uplift rate and the internal system dynamics all interacting. Uh, and I think that can give you really complicated feedbacks that we don't always get a linear, um, yeah. you know, a linear translation of that external forcing into sediment flux uh, out of the basin. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, or, or I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> it was easier when Dorothy was picking and then I didn't have to worry <laughs> about it. So let's, let's start with Kim. Dorothy gave us the direction to come to the microphone yeah. and wait in line if we had a question. So I'm following Dorothy's direction as president. <laughs> Go for it, Kim. You have the mic. Yes. 
<laughs> I feel very powerful, I have to say. But no, um, my question is regarding the second part of the first part of your talk when you were talking about ways that organic carbon may be uh, absorbed at different parts of the stream bed. And you said floodplain versus flow. And you had the experiment in sort of a coat geometry, mm -hmm. a spinning geometry, and you put sediments in. And you said something about the microbes went in with the sediments. Um, and, and, and you didn't get any reduction. And so I'm, I'm repeating part of it to make sure that I understood it mm -hmm. correctly. You're right. But that the organic carbon didn't go down. In fact, it actually in your graph, it tiny bit looked like it went up a bit. But I'm wondering, um, in, part, in, in, in large part motivated by wanting to, like I'm a boring spherical particle person, <laughs> wanting to do more exciting real particle with you know climate change implications on it. How, how did you sort of monitor what you had in terms of microbes going in? I mean, I understand you sampled the, you got the sediment. I didn't. Okay. And then did you do sort of what size particle did you do? And did it differ from one experiment to the next? Or was it kind of a limited <laughs> series range? Yeah, so it depended on the experiment. With the Rio Bermejo, I grabbed some bank sediment from the Bermejo and just put in that, and it, what, in that case, it was very fine sediment. I think it had a D50 of about 30 microns. Uh, with some of the other stuff, uh, with shale, I went out and collected shale from the field, from, from bedrock outcrops. Then I crushed it and I sieved it to different sizes to see if there was a grain size effect. Uh, because you know the hypothesis here that I, I didn't have time to get into, um, but if, if any of you were in my, my talk earlier today, I, I went through this that I thought, man, coarse grain sizes are going to abrade rapidly. We're going to make really fine abrasion products, uh, have a really high surface area, and we're going to get tons of organic carbon oxidation. And I was so stoked to do these experiments because I thought I could do something like what Leonard Sklar did in 2001 with his you know, abrasion mills that were really revolutionary and look at what, how bedrock erosion was influenced by changing grain size, changing sediment supply, all these things if we could get organic carbon to be oxidized in the flume. Uh, and then when I had coarse sediment and it abraded, we basically didn't see any organic carbon oxidation. Uh, and then when I had fine sediment that already had a high surface area, we also didn't really see any detectable organic carbon oxidation. We saw interesting changes in the dissolved organic carbon concentration through time, um, but we weren't getting large fluxes of DOC that matched the type of organic carbon oxidation we get in river networks when we move things order a thousand kilometers. So for the global carbon cycle, it just seems like what's happening in the rivers is, is not fundamental, save for the fact that you are breaking particles down, putting finer particles into the floodplains where maybe you can you know, change reaction rates there. I thank you for that. And I also, it seems to me like someone who knows microbial ecology, which I don't, and I don't, you know, but it seems like it's an exciting area for exploration to, you know, because if you don't know what, you got to maybe know microbes that would have otherwise yeah. broken it down. Because you're not expecting the sediment to break it down, right? And, and I'm showing my ignorance, but I mean, it's the microbes that are going to be doing it, right? Or some of both? Uh, you know, I, th I think that. Uh, for the predominant view is that, that these reactions are microbially mediated. Yep. There's probably some, you know, certainly you can put organic carbon in an oven, you can heat up the temperature and, and you lose it, right? So there are inorganic pathways out there. But yeah, I agree. Like this is an opportunity for us to, you know, go home, talk to our colleagues in other departments and find ways that we can put these disparate fields together. Thank you so much. It was a really great talk. Thanks. Uh, I want to second that. That was a really remarkably clear and cogent talk. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Gordon. Um, I would like to explore a little bit your mechanism for your waterfall formation and offer a slightly different potential interpretation than, than uh, Dr. Doug down here. Um, and that is, you, as I understand it, you had you started with a flume that was supercritical. That's and, right. And you were running supercritical flow down it and particles along, uh, you know, that that went along with it. One of the things we know is that nature doesn't like to stay at supercritical flow for very long, and it, there's a simple explanation for that: that any perturbation in the bed tends to extract energy. You get a hydraulic jump, 
and which extracts more energy, and the system tends to gravitate towards, a, away from supercritical, towards a more transcritical flow state. And that's sort of what I think you observed. Is that correct? Uh, I think you're, I, I agree with you 100%, right? We started with a planar bed with supercritical flow. We went into a transcritical state by making steps and pools. E exactly. And that, and that, that, of course, that piqued my interest. I wonder then if one of the mechanisms that is determining that, that that really is a hydrodynamic mechanism that is influencing your spacing and the extent of your waterfall. So then once they form, they, they sort of have their own dynamics and they form their own dimensions and, and they interact among themselves as you've nicely described. But I wonder if, for example, in you, you imposed a step, a uh, empirically determined uh, slope threshold as a way to sort of drive your model. And I wonder if you could do that using a hydrodynamic interpretation where you actually calculate the fruit number and use that, the fruit, what that threshold that gives you, say, supercritical versus subcritical flow as the slope that then uh, manifests in your model. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, this is, this is exactly what we want to do. Uh, and Erica Groh, who's a, a PhD student working with me now, is, is starting to do some of this. Of course, it's hard to do it uh, in nature everywhere, right? Because fruit number is changing with discharge variability and all these other factors. So our approach is to go out to the field, populate that plot I showed you with a bunch of data, but also go back to the lab, make the large scale experiment I showed you smaller, and then actually run through a range of slopes uh, where we can look to see how when we're changing slope and we're, you know, we can change slope holding fruit constant, we can let fruit vary with slope, and actually uh, through doing a series of experiments, start to map out the, the parameter space about where we form waterfalls and where we don't. There is some really nice theory uh, by uh, Azumi that came out in 2017 uh, in JGR that predicts the formation of cyclic steps, so these kind of repeating steps and pools in bedrock that I think waterfalls can develop out of. And it's not, it's not exactly a, a fruit supercritical flow is a necessary but insufficient condition. So I think we need to do a little bit more mapping out of exactly where these things occur. But 100% the right idea. Great, thanks. It is 6 o'clock. How many people are lined up for questions? If I can get a show of hands back there, are there two of you? If we could do them fairly quickly, we could fit those two in, and then it would be time to end. Exciting stuff, uh, Joel. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to focus, Thanos Papanicolaou, actually, from the University of Tennessee. I'm going to focus on your first part of the talk. And in major rivers, you do have a lot of flooding and exchanges you know, taking place between colluvium and alluvium and what I call the trading process in, in sediment. I was wondering if you have looked actually into those aspects and the implications of the trading to the organic carbon uh, along the floodplain. And did you capture that signature of that exchange uh, along your floodplain? Yeah, so I, I, didn't, I didn't look at that uh, specifically. I tried to put everything into this sediment residence time framework. And I think you can add a lot of complications to the system uh, and, and think about it uh, in more detail. Uh, if you were in Madison Douglas's talk earlier today, uh, she's been doing similar things in the Arctic and has some exciting results. Uh, but for me, I think um, as a first step, it was easiest just to think about this in a pure sediment residence time. Uh, if you have ideas, uh, let's talk offline. Absolutely. Andrew. Thanks for your talk, Joel. Is it OK if I ask a question? Um, I, w I just want to know about the scaling of your experiments about the um, steps that form. I guess uh, I don't know how, how wide the channels are compared to the gravel you put down there. The gravel is small for the field, but is it small for the experiment relative to what you see in the field? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll point out um, specifically uh, that the channel cut itself. So we started with a flume that was wider than the slot canyon that was cut. So this was something that the, the channel decided itself. 
I think that the, the average flume width uh, of the slot canyon was about four times greater than the grain size. Um, so yeah, those grains are coarse uh, relative to the, the channel width. Uh, the idea, we didn't know what would happen, uh, and the idea was uh, let's use some coarse grains uh, and because that's going to give us the fastest erosion rates because we didn't know how long this would take to form. Varying grain size and seeing what that effect is uh, is something that I hope uh, Erica Grow uh, is going to do as part of her PhD to start digging into this. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.